So, um, just a couple uh, things about today. When the groups got together and decided to host this forum, our goal was to give you a good look at the, ca the candidates in the race who are running in both races. That was our first filter, that we wanted the people who were committed to running not only in the special election, but also in the regular election. And currently there are 19 people who are registered to do that, and at the time that we got together and, and sent out invites, not all of those people were registered, but the people you see today are the people who were registered at that point and who also have made, um, have done significant fundraising and have pretty active campaigns going. So that's how we end up with the panel that we have today. So our format for today will be that we'll have opening statements from each of the candidates and we'll go alphabetically. So we'll start with Nick Begich and then everybody will follow him. And you'll, they'll each have two minutes for their opening statements. Then each of the CEOs will have one question to ask on behalf of their association, and each candidate will have a minute to respond to that. And then, of course, we have to have a lightning round, and that's where we'll end. And most importantly, the question we could ask more than anything else is when will the video be available? We are recording today, and we'll have that ready for people tomorrow morning. So, without any further ado, Mr. Begich, if you'd like to start with your opening statement. Thank you very much. Wow. Okay. My name is Nick Begich uh, III. I am a lifelong Republican and a conservative Republican. I am from uh, the state of Alaska. Actually, I actually grew up down in what I call the free state of Florida. My, my grandparents uh, raised me on my mom's side. And a lot of people ask, well, how in the heck does a Begich become a Republican? A raised Republican by grandparents who are Bible Belt Southern Republicans from Southeast Missouri. So I grew up down there, raised in the church, K through 12 Christian school, ended up going to Baylor University in Texas where I got a business degree with a focus in uh, entrepreneurship, worked in investor relations for a publicly traded company for a while, thought I was doing real well, and asked my girlfriend's dad if we could get married, and he said, how about no? And I said, well, what's it gonna take? He said, why don't you get your master's degree? So I went back to Indiana University, got a master's degree in information technology and decision sciences. Worked at Ford Motor Company for a few years in the Dearborn, Michigan area and decided that I uh, didn't love Detroit all that much. And uh, my wife and I, we did get married in case you're wondering, my wife and I decided that we would uh, go on an adventure, move to Alaska, and that was almost 20 years ago. So I own a software development company, I'm an investor, I have investments uh, both within Alaska and outside of Alaska. Uh, we've got about 150 people in three countries that build software applications for startups. I've been involved in the Alaska Republican Party as a state finance co-chair. I'm a fellow with the Club for Growth. I was co-chair for Don Young's 2020 campaign. And I've been uh, in the race for about six months. Excited uh, and honored to be here this morning and looking forward to talking about the issues. Thank you very much. Good morning. Well, I'm John Coghill, and uh, I'm running to be your next congressman. Now, this seat belongs to Alaska, and I'm an Alaska. It belongs to all of us. So all of us here at this front table uh, want to serve you, and I, I'm glad for that. So I was born and raised here uh, in the interior. Uh, we're a river district. Nenana was a stepping off point. We, had, uh, we were quite a shipping lane. And the rivers uh, in Alaska were the original transportation system. Now we're air, we're water, we're, uh, we're trying to be uh, uh, better at our ground transportation. That's a work in progress. So I just wanted to let you all know that you're working in Alaska. Uh,
So we became aware of the federal land holdings in Alaska very significantly when the plasma miners took a hit. And so the no more clause is a big deal to me. The mining world is a big deal to me. I'm willing to keep plugging away at it. But when we go to America, the resources of Alaska are going to be very important. Now we're running into debt in America, and that's a shame on America, but we've got to be part of it. Good morning. My name is Christopher Constant. I'm proud to be running for U.S. Congress for Alaska. Um, I decided last year to make this run, and February kicked off this race. Like one other person on this died, so I respect for jumping in early and being committed. I got my start in Anchorage serving as a volunteer in a local community suffering in uh, a substantial uh, disorder because of bad federal policy, road policy. That led me to be elected to the Anchorage Assembly. In that time, I've been serving hard this community to improve our infrastructure, including the Port of Alaska and the federal highways that run through our neighborhoods. More than any other state in the Union, Alaska is dependent on federal support because the promises of statehood have yet to be fulfilled. And I intend to work on those promises being fulfilled. When it comes to developing our resources, which is what this group is here for, Alaska can proudly say we worked hard to protect the beauty of the place we call home and respect the original stewards of this land so we hear from them when we make our development decisions and also the industry that provides important benefits to the communities, whether it's economic development or community benefits, it creates jobs and opportunities for generations to come. As Alaska's representative in Congress, I'm going to work hard to work on that D.C. disconnect that happens where people in D.C have an idea of what Alaska is like, but they do not understand. There's a new form of colonialism out there where there are nonprofits that are trying to tell rural communities how they can develop, and that does not work for Alaska. There's a story I know of a grant that I was writing where a federal bureaucrat told us we couldn't use airfare because grants didn't allow it to get to communities across the state. There were no roads. That's the disconnect I'm going to work really hard to help people understand. I honor you and thank you for the work you do for our economy and the people of Alaska. Good morning. My name is Al Gross. I'm a doctor, a commercial fisherman, father of four, and a life on Alaska. Alaska is an independent state, and we need a strong, independent voice to represent us in Washington. taught me that the backbone of Alaska's economy is sustainable resource development. Growing up in Juneau, I learned how important mining and tourism are to our economy. I watched my father and Jay Hammond cross party lines to create the permanent fund and the dividend from our tremendous oil wealth. These are all very important industries here in Alaska. And when I get to Congress, I will work with you to help them grow. But as a lifelong Alaskan, I've seen firsthand what happens when our oil production declines, our fisheries collapse, health care and transportation costs skyrocket, and small businesses shut their doors and move away. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has highlighted the important role Alaska must play to ensure that America is energy independent. We can't leave our economy and our national security vulnerable to the unpredictable decision making of other countries like Russia. China. If elected to Congress, I'll work hard to expand our energy sector, including renewable energy, and I will work with you to finally produce and market our vast natural gas resource. I will be an enthusiastic supporter of our mining and tourism industries, and I will work, will work to lower our cost of living here in Alaska, which will diversify our economy. I'll fight for sustainable fisheries and will cement Alaska's role as a geopolitical and military force in the Arctic. I'm excited to be a strong, independent voice for Alaska. I very much appreciate your vote. Thank you. I'm Jeff Lowenfels, and I play the role of garden columnist in the Anchorage Daily News. But I also have a real life. I majored in geology. I spent my summers prospecting all around North America. I went to law school, and I came to Alaska to become a natural resources attorney. And I did. I trained as an assistant attorney general representing all of the national resources agencies that you people deal with, including the Division of Lands, the Division of Oil 
Oil and Gas, the Division of Minerals and Energy Management, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, DEC, Fish and Game, the Alaska Pipeline Commission, and the Alaska Public Utilities Commission. And then I went into private practice. And there I represented, among others, Conoco, Amarada Hess, Norgasco, EG&G Seismic, Ashton Mining out of Good News Bay, Usabelli Coal, Alaska Apollo Gold Mine in the Shumigans, individual miners, Callista Corporation, and several native village corporations, and many others. Some of you actually are in this room right now. And finally, I was general counsel and then CEO of the Yukon Pacific Project. We permitted the Trans-Alaska Gas System, 800 miles across federal and state lands, with two EISs, the one for the LNG facility in Valdez right after the Exxon spill. I dealt with more federal agencies and had more ANSCA and ANILCA interactions than you can shake a stick at, and often I wanted to. There, these are the same water quality permits, wetlands mitigation arguments, ancient PLOs, land status, and access problems that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So believe me, as Congressman, I will support you. I understand development, I'm in favor of development, and you will have somebody representing you who understands what you have to do to deal with Alaska problems. And I also happen to know how to grow a couple of plants here this way. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. I'm Sarah Palin, and uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate what it is that you all do and the organizers of this forum. I really, really appreciate all you, all you gals. Thank you for doing uh, all this hard work. Um, and my brother is a part of this also. He, uh, Chuck Jr. with Hawk, um, keeping me informed of um, what all that you've been accomplishing. I really appreciate what it is that you do uh, because you know how to do it better. The oil and gas and mineral developments in this state, you know how to do that better and safer and more ethical than some far off faceless bureaucrat or politician in some bubble who's going to tell Alaska when and where and how we're going to develop our resources. The federal government needs to back off. In fact, government, get off our back, get back on our side, and allow Alaskans to access our God-given natural resources that are created for mankind's responsible use. Alaska is the Fort Knox of this country. And if we're allowed to tap into these oil, gas, mineral, deposits that we have so richly underfoot that America will be safer. We will be able to positively affect our sovereignty, our solvency. But first and foremost, Alaska. Alaska comes first. I've been blessed to have lived here all my life um, from a family of school teachers and um, I as a commercial fisherman and then um, city council member, mayor, city manager, being able to serve as your governor and chair of the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, and then uh, being tapped to represent the GOP as the vice presidential nominee in the McCain-Palin uh, campaign. So I'm running also to be your congressman, your congresswoman, and uh, it would be just the honor of a lifetime to work for you. Good morning. Hard to follow Sarah Palin. <laughs> uh, my nickname is Agasha. My English name is Mary Paltola. I'm from Bethel. I, um, like I said, I'm a Yupik Eskimo. I'm a salmon advocate and a former Democratic state legislator from Bethel. I'm a mother of four. I'm a stepmother of three, and I'm a proud grandmother of two young granddaughters. Um, this summer, we'll be sending an Alaskan to Congress to shoulder the heavy responsibilities of championing our interests in the federal government and bringing money back home. This is one of the things that Congressman Don Young did best. And for those of you who knew him well and knew him personally as I did, I want to offer you my condolences. Um, Alaska, we are now looking at a, um, you know, in a congressional delegation of three, Missing one is a huge is a huge uh, gap, and I would like to serve in that position to help bring stability back to our congressional delegation. I've spent my life working for Alaska and Alaskans. During my 10 years in the state legislature, I helped rebuild and I chaired the bipartisan Bush Caucus, which passed legislation 
and influence budgets which improve lives in rural Alaska and in fact across Alaska. I'm a champion for K-12 K education as well as university funding and vocational technical programs. Recently, as Executive Director of the Cuscoquan River Intertribal Fish Commission, I led 118 tribes as well as many other rural Alaskans to uh, champion for abundant salmon returns in Western Alaska. The situation that we have across rural Alaska um, is one of, I think, very serious food insecurity, and I would like to um, work on reauthorizing Magnuson-Stevens Act to look at ways that we can um, factor in adaptive management. All right, thank you, my time's up. Hi, I'm Josh Redak, and I'm running because it feels like the country's going to hell and they're trying to take Alaska with it. Uh, we've seen riots over the past couple of years, folks pushing to defund the police, the most disgusting, divisive behaviors uh, in civ civ civic discourse. Inflation is out of control. Uh, gas prices are high. Um, we're seeing outrageous prices at the grocery store yet. The federal government wants to stop us uh, at every turn from producing our natural resources, which is just absolutely outrageous. So the country might be going to hell, but I've been there before. It's in Southwest Asia. I shed blood there. I got a good tan. Um, I know how to operate in that environment. I grew up poor, um, worked for everything we had, uh, bought a hobby farm when I was a preteen, was an only child, learned how to work very, very hard. Joined the military right after September 11th and deployed. Spent six years in Germany, two in Iraq. I was ultimately wounded in combat in Ramadi, Iraq in 2006. Uh, and then I joined Congressman Young's team fighting for Alaskans against federal bureaucrats that were trying to oppress us. I uh, earned quite a reputation for being successful at that, and I ran for office and I've served in the legislature for four years and last year. I passed more bills than we can in the legislature for good bills, which I'm proud of most of the most people in this case are the problems we needed to solve. So I know how to work hard, I know how to fight, and I know how to serve, and I will do all of those with every fiber of my being if I'm given the opportunity to do so, and that's really what we're here asking for is that opportunity. And so I appreciate the time. Thanks for putting this debate together. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Again, my name is Josh Rainback. Well, good morning. My name is Tara Sweeney, and I am also running for Congress. Uh, I'm like you, and I represent the fabric of Alaska. I grew up in rural Alaska. I'm from the North Slope, and I made my home in Kirkwood. Uh, for those that I have not met yet, I'm uh, a former executive with ASRC, uh, and I'm currently a small business owner. And I want to point out that the leadership in my region developed the playbook for responsible development in Alaska. I've had the opportunity to work with industry on initiatives like workforce development, tax, and other community initiatives. And I've worked in leadership to negotiate benefits that add value to Alaskan communities impacted by potential projects. I also bring executive branch experience. I uh, am the former uh, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Uh, I was appointed by the United States Senate unanimously and uh, originally nominated by President Trump. And I'm really proud of the service that I uh, provided on behalf of Alaska and Indian country in Washington, D.C. We are embarking, Alaska as a state is embarking on a new chapter with respect to our congressional delegation. And the question before voters is who is best equipped to represent Alaska in Washington, D.C. I've spent over 20 years of my life advocating for Alaska in Washington, D.C., uh, walking the halls of Congress. I have a proven track record of advocacy on the congressional side and of implementation on the executive branch side. My campaign is focused on a robust economy, strong labor force, and healthy communities. And for 50 years, Don Young fought tirelessly for this state, and I stand before you asking for your support. Thank you. Thank 
very much to each of the candidates for those opening statements. So now we're going to move to the question round from the association CEOs in just a little bit about how we're going to do this. With five questions and nine candidates, obviously not everybody gets a chance to, uh, to go first. So each of the CEOs will draw a name from here and then and announce that and then ask their question. And so the name that is drawn will go first and then we'll just go in in order alphabetically after that. And there will be one minute for each of the candidates to respond. We do have a timer up front who's doing a great job. And in the most extreme scenarios, we may cut somebody's mic off. Not to be rude, just to keep people on time. So we'll start with Alicia Sierra from the Associated General Contractor. Good morning. My name is Alicia and I serve as the Executive Director of Associated General Contractors of Alaska. AGC's mission is to advocate, educate, and promote the construction industry in our state. Oh, I already forgot the instructions. All right, first up is uh, Mr. Cockell. There was no greater supporter of infrastructure than Congressman Don Young. During his career, he served as chairman of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and fought to ensure that Alaska got its fair share of funding for roads and bridges by advocating and voting for highway bills. What are your priorities on how to address the transportation and infrastructure needs here in Alaska? It would probably fall the suit that uh, Don Young brought up on transportation. Alaska has not uh, built as many roads as it should. America still has uh, that they can do for Alaska and for Alaska. So the money coming in is uh, important and it should come from Congress. Uh, Alaska still has a geography uh, where 60 plus percent is the federal government. They have a responsibility and I think uh, they should share and so should the state. Uh, also, the workforce going into that construction work is going to be a very big deal right now.
I'm glad that you uh, prefaced the question with the suggestion of priorities, because that's exactly what it's about. A uh, federal government that's 25 trillion, 30 trillion, 100 trillion, nobody really knows the number because there's so much distrust in our government, giving us the correct numbers. That debt that is growing and growing, it has to be about priorities. Alaska needs to be allowed to access our resources in order to feed the rest of the U.S. and in order to make Alaska great again. Uh, so it's going to be about roads. Roads, water, and sewer. Very basic things that you learn on a local level when you are a city manager, and that's what you're supposed to be concentrating on. Also, we're going to have projects coming down the pipe that are so exciting for Alaska and for the rest of the U.S., but we will have a worker shortage. So the promotion of Bowtech education in our public schools and in alternative schools, that's going to be most important, and the feds can help out with that. Coming from Bethel, I have a very keen understanding of our logistics supply chain and our transportation needs. Um, <clears throat> and having spent 10 years in Juneau, I, I definitely um, am concerned about the marine highway system for all of the southeast villages. Um, I think that we need a renewed um, you know, um, champion for essential air services as well as bypass mail. Um, I live in Bethel currently, and we have two flights coming out of Bethel every day. We get jet service twice a day. We used to get jet service three times a day. And many of our um, remote villages often just have one carrier. And this is a significant concern in a state where we really have six states within our state and so many regions with their own um, transportation issues. But certainly this is something that we have got to remain committed to. Thank you. Well, the, the regulatory environment has been out of control for decades. Uh, even if we get roads funded, it takes years, sometimes over a decade, to even get them permitted or built. Uh, Ambler, I think, is an amazing example of, of trying, trying to reach minerals that the country needs. Some of those minerals uh, are really good for innovative and clean energy solutions, but yet uh, they make it impossible to even build the road even if there is funding. So I think there's a lot of work to do to ease the, the regulatory burdens that we face at the federal levels. I think there are four uh, points that I'd like to make with respect to promoting uh, transportation and infrastructure. First, we need to identify those challenges uh, and the needs within Alaska and the proposed solutions that so many Alaskans will have with respect to our infrastructure needs. Uh, looking at how we build relationships in Congress so that we have brand ambassadors that are going to support uh, policy positions that benefit Alaska. I also believe uh, that we need to analyze our the matching requirements that we see coming down from the federal government uh, and, and to identify any sort of exemptions uh, or tweaks that we can provide to those pieces of, of uh, current law and future law that provide parity for Alaska as a new state or an advantage for Alaska with respect to transportation and infrastructure. And I will vigorously defend the, the formula in the safety blue transportation. Well, like the other candidates here, I'm very much pro hard infrastructure. I think what we've seen uh, many times with the debate on infrastructure, we've got a maintenance budget, and we've got a new cap budget. And what we haven't seen in the state of Alaska in the last 40 years is a new road. And while we've been very successful bringing money back, we've been unsuccessful at opening up the resource areas to the state. The resources of Alaska are in rural Alaska. And we have got to be able to access rural Alaska with roads and rail, and I am very much a proponent of that. I think as we continue this infrastructure discussion in the nation, we need to make sure that Alaska gets its due. And we see the East Coast getting a lot of so-called Green New Deal investment, and yet we're a century behind in much of our state. We've got to be an advocate. We've got to have uh, a strong ambassadorship among the delegation, and I will be that strong voice for you in Congress to open up the state of Alaska with hard infrastructure investments. Thank you all.
morning. My name is Leila Kimbrell and I am the Executive Director for the Resource Development Council for Alaska, also known as RBC. We are a statewide business association comprised of members from Alaska's fishing, forestry, mining, oil and gas, and tourism industries. Before I ask the question today, let me draw a card. And the candidate to answer first will be Mr. Gross. RDC's question is, if elected, what will be your top two priorities to benefit responsible resource development in Alaska? And how will you build the coalitions necessary to achieve consensus and move the, those priorities in the House? Thank you for your question. Uh, my, my top priority when I get to Congress will be to balance the budget and get inflation under control. Uh, it's a huge problem uh, nationally. And as a doctor, I've worked uh, I've taken care of everyone, uh, both sides of the aisle. Uh, that's how I will approach being a congressman when I get there. When I get there, because I really believe you need to establish trust, make friends uh, with all parties in order to get things done. Uh, I understand the infrastructure needs here in Alaska, and I will work uh, with anyone and everyone who will help me uh, to benefit Alaska. Happy to go next. Uh, my top two priorities. Well, I'm quite concerned, obviously, about access to our natural resources. Uh, I'm quite concerned about the fact that we've got an ANILCA in place that's being ignored, and I think we need to work very hard on that. That Amber Road is a perfect example. It is going to be built because the law requires it to be built. It was messed up, and we need to make sure that we straighten it out and we get it going. The second thing, of course, that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about right now is the infrastructure monies that we got, particularly the broadband monies. We need to make sure that it doesn't take 10 years. No child has 10 years to wait for broadband. Uh, just one moment, if we could remind candidates to turn off their mics once they finish uh, for the next candidate to answer. Thank you. When I get to Congress, the first thing that I'll do is what I've always done, and that is fight the corruption that is absolutely getting in the way of America's growth and prosperity and Alaska's growth and prosperity. I've been fighting against a party machine my entire 30 years of being involved in politics and of course on a federal level. The corruption is huge and that will be my commitment and uh, no, I promise you that, that that's going to be uh, my focus so that we can trust what our government is doing and the decisions being made with our money. And then also uh, establishing a reputation as being a fighter for Alaska's interests, first and foremost. And the issues that we're working on, they're nonpartisan issues, the issues that we need uh, addressed for Alaska sovereignty and solvency also. Uh, it should be nonpartisan, responsible development of our resources. Broadband, broadband, broadband. Um, I think that jobs in the future are tech jobs, and right now our broadband in, uh, across rural Alaska is, is not good. Um, I would also support drilling in the 1002 area, as well as opening up the Amber Road. Well, I've been reaching out to members of Congress, members on the Resources Committee, and regardless of who gets elected, I think it's important that they save a seat for Alaska on the Resources Committee. I think that's very probable. Um, so seeking a seat on the Resources Committee will be critical. The second thing is, like I said before, uh, easing regulatory burdens where it makes sense. We want to develop responsibly, but as many of you know, some of these regulations are far from responsible. Um, strategic relationships are so important for uh, the next member from the state of Alaska. We only get one out of 435 strategic relationships are important. Uh, I think I've proven that in the legislature. I passed a bill just yesterday in, in a very toxic environment uh, relationship-wise, and I think, uh, I think we can make those strategic relationships. I think that would be critical. Uh, as many in this room understand the climate in Washington, D.C., there's strangulation by regulation. Uh, and so 
Uh, my focus will be to provide the certainty for the companies that are interested in producing Alaska's uh, natural resources, and that means removing the bureaucratic red tape. Uh, DOI accountability and oversight is critical. We're seeing uh, that today, just with the announcement of closing off the Cook Inlet uh, for oil and gas development. And so I would like to explore, and I would propose with this group to explore what an Alaska standard looks like for federal legislation that provides, that minimizes the litigation risks that companies in this state face uh, when proposing development projects in Alaska. And to look at driving agency behavior uh, with enacted timelines so that there is more certainty in the process. Thank you. So the question being, what two uh, <coughs> actions would you take in the Congress to support resource development? One, I think we need deeper reform. Uh, I would like to see uh, us remove the requirement for measuring CO2 emissions as a part of uh, project approvals. Um, I think one of the things that, that really uh, drove the success of the pipeline was an abatement of lawsuits. And I would like to see for the nation's critical energy and minerals production an abatement of lawsuits uh, so that we can actually move these projects forward. If they're truly critical, we should be willing as a Congress to do that. I think as we talk about building consensus within the Congress, it's important to recognize that so many of our friends on the left actually uh, claim to be pro-resource development as it relates to critical minerals, yet those minerals are sourced from jurisdictions in which there is very little environmental framework or any honoring of international labor laws as it relates to children. And I'd like to see us make that argument to them effectively to do the work here in the state of Alaska. Thank you. National Vet is a national disgrace, and part of what we can do in Alaska is help them in the critical uh, minerals, where the minerals are going to be a big part of it. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to collaborate. And so the first thing I would do is probably go try to get that Alaska Land Use Council back under uh, operation so that we can work with the federal government to actually use these lands properly. And then in the Arctic and the Pacific, we're probably going to be the, the Arctic state. Uh, we're going to be the transportation safety corridor. Uh, from everything from a Coast Guard to uh, communication systems is going to be very important for us. We have to watch the waters of the United States that wants to shut Alaska down. And I think it's going to be important that not only we fight for Alaska, but we fight for that reasonable approach. So the last Land Use Council, uh, watching the water of the United States turn that into something more productive. Top two priorities our ports, our airports, our rail, our roads. You can't do your work if you can't get the resources out to do the work and you can't get the resources you're developing back into market without clear access. We've struggled with that and we continue to struggle with that, whether it's in the southeast or in the west where we need a new strategic port. So I'll be supporting that because the Arctic is going to become the center of the world over the next 20 years. We need to spend our time thinking about being in the future and ready for the opportunities that are coming instead of wasting our time thinking about just the past and how we can undo the harms of the past. Alaska is positioned to be the world leader in technology transfer for climate change because it's changing here faster. I will be driving investment to Alaska so that our industries that are leading in climate change and resilience, all of your industries are doing that, are going to lead the world in transforming and meeting the challenges of the future. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Kara Moriarty and I work for the Alaska Oil and Gas Association, commonly referred to as AOGA. We are the professional trade association for the majority of producers, explorers, refiners and marketing and transportation of oil and gas resources. And our mission is to advocate for the long-term viability of the oil and gas industry. So thank you to all of the candidates for being here. This is my question today. And the first candidate, and like raffle tickets, we gotta always like mix them up, right? Um, Governor Palin will go first. This year is the 45th anniversary of tax, and more than 18 billion barrels of oil 
have been produced from the North Slope, mostly from state-owned lands. We see a promising future ahead, especially from development from federal lands, like MPRA. But these projects face legal and regulatory headwinds from a variety of activists. What specifically will you do in Congress to promote development on federal land and ensure these projects receive a fair and timely regulatory approval process? Governor Payne. We have to fight by this 30 by 30 plan, and we need to educate the rest of Congress about what that green energy plan of this actually means and how that impacts other countries, their relationships with the U.S. So many of these green policy plans of the Biden administration, they're essentially cooperating with countries like China, China wanting to wipe America, financially speaking, off the face of the earth. China wanting to own America. That's what these green energy policies are gonna lead to unless we have a fighter in Congress who can help educate the rest of America, the citizens of America, as to what it's gonna to take to, yes, as we move towards a greener energy plan, what it's gonna to take to develop our hydrocarbons to get there and to make sure that China doesn't succeed in its ultimate goal, and that's being the one superpower on the globe. I do think we have a robust regulatory process, and I know that for all resource development projects, it takes about 100 permits to get that project um, on track and, and moving forward. I do think that um, the process that we have in place now should give folks confidence that the project is safe, and um, it does help build public support for those projects. So I really just stand behind the permitting process that we have in place now for our oil and gas projects. Thank you. I think education is critical. Um, they, they use environmentalism and social responsibility to shut down our projects. They talk about it all the time. I was just reading some national press about um, this gas seepage uh, in MPRA. I just, it, it blows my mind because the, the reason that they catch issues like this is because we do it better here. We have houses on top of the wellheads. They don't do that overseas. I've seen refineries, I've seen oil fields in the Middle East. They don't do those things over there. And so the fact that we're able to catch a small uh, seepage and stop it, and immediately they were shoving concrete down in there to stop this leak, they wouldn't have even caught it in many places overseas. And so I think educate people on why stopping our production here is not socially responsible and it's not environmentally friendly. I think a lot of people would hear that message. Instead, we're bankrolling Russia's invasion uh, of the Ukraine. We bought more oil from Russia last year as a nation than we were allowed to produce in Alaska. The federal government owns 61% of uh, lands in Alaska and in Anilka, uh, we are afforded the uh, opportunity to access our resources. And there, the, the no more clause is something that's extremely important and it needs to be vigorously defended uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And so uh, looking at, uh, at different provisions like the environmental uh, justice provisions or Equal Access to Justice Act and taking a look at the language that locks up and creates, uns locks up our lands and creates uncertainty in the regulatory process is something that I, I certainly will uh, examine. So as a part owner in a uh, copper prospect in the Wrangell St. Elias National Park, 820 acres of patented mining ground, this is certainly a personal issue to me. I think Anilka uh, has a number of uh, issues, both in its original construction and in its enforcement. I think that we've got to do more as both the state and our federal government to assure land access rights to inholders throughout the state. Um, as was mentioned, 61% of the state is owned by the federal government, and the federal government must unlock Alaska's resources for the benefit of all of Alaskans. 
As I mentioned previously, we need to do more with uh, accelerating NEPA reform. We can accelerate permitting uh, by actions of the Congress. That's something specifically that I would work on. And what we've got internationally right now is an environment of what I call environmental arbitrage, where we have high standards and other nations do not. And much of the, the resources that we ultimately consume through finished products are manufactured in those regions of the world, and we need to do more to exert pressure to ensure that we have a level playing field internationally. Alaska has done it as good as it can be done in the world. But that's not been true in China. So we have a good track record. We have to be able to convince our sister states that the National Petroleum Reserve is not a national park. And I think we have to work hard on that. Uh, and so you have to bust through that first before you get into even the 1002 area, which was guaranteed under uh, 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 an agreement in ANILCA. Alaska has a unique law, ANILCA. The other states don't have that. They don't understand it. We need to stand up. I will definitely work to help people and members of my own party understand that the National Petroleum Reserve is actually a petroleum reserve that we need to develop in those areas and have the federal benefits coming to the lands of the people. In fact, one thing I would do that would be bold is I would argue, we should all argue to the President at this time, that we should implement the Defense Production Act to build the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline that can rebalance the international equation of energy and it can take back what we've seen in Europe away from Vladimir Putin. It can position us to lead and it can then benefit Alaska for the next hundred years. And so I would strongly argue that there are bold and new ways for us to think and work with our delegation to get projects like that done and moving using the tools that exist in the climate that we're in now. I remember when the pipeline was built back in the 70s. It was an amazing project. Of course, they'd done a gas line at the same time. Uh, Alaska's got a short-term term problem right now. We need jobs, and we're importing 2.5 million barrels of oil a day from Russia. We need to be energy independent here in America. That's really critical for our national security. And we probably have 30 or 40 years of, marketable, of, of markets for, for our natural gas. We need to develop that and take advantage of it while there's still a the I agree that there are too many regulations holding back the industry. The federal government, the federal government needs to stop taking lands off of the block of, that are potentially developable, developable, such as MPRA and the Cook Inlet leases. The question is how are we going to get the Congress to understand the federal oil and gas lands here in Alaska? We need to explain your success at being environmental and sustainably developing groups. We need to explain that we know how to do it and have done it properly here in the state of Alaska. And I'll use my chops as a top organic gardener to help you and support that issue. To get strategic minerals, you need oil and gas. To defeat Russia and its Ukraine problems, we need to supply oil and gas to other nations. We need to do this, and we need to do it now, and as a member of Congress, that's what I'll work on. I will support your mission. Thank you. Next is the last chamber. Good morning, my name is Katie Capozzi, and I serve as the President and CEO of the Alaska Chamber. We are the state's largest business advocacy organization, and our mission is to promote a healthy business environment in Alaska. And our question is about inflation and how to address inflation. And I recognize that there are a handful of levers um, uh, to address inflation, but this is the Resource Industry Forum, so this is going to be through the lens of energy policy. In March, year-over-year -year consumer price increases topped 8.5%, causing the highest inflationary rise in 40 years. Two major solutions to combat inflation have been offered. Increase our domestic energy supply, thereby reducing energy costs, or introduce a windfall profits tax on energy companies and use the proceeds to provide relief to taxpayers. Which policy do you prefer and why? And the first person 
will be Senator Reback. Thank you. I think increasing our domestic energy supply is critical. Um, I feel very strongly about it. Uh, I, and I think related to gas, um, we need to figure out how to get our gas to market. I, I know it was brought up, but every time AGDC has come before the Resources Committee, uh, their figures show that we're going to be subsidizing this gas uh, for potentially decades. And so I've heard that's changed. I think we need to take a very, very close look at how we can economically bring our gas to market. I think we need to fight with everything we've got uh, to increase our production and then infrastructure, you know, just the budget, just two days ago, uh, I worked very closely with the Senator from Nome and we passed an amendment into the budget to fund the Port of Nome and the Port of Alaska. And I think, I think all three of those things of increasing energy production is critical. Uh, resource development is the backbone of my campaign. Without it, uh, we wouldn't have the tools necessary to uh, promote a robust uh, economy, build a strong labor force, or uh, create and promote services for healthier communities. So I would definitely support the former rather than the latter. Thank you. Well, as we look at the, uh, the inflation picture nationally, as was mentioned, we have a higher level of inflation right now than we've seen in 40 years in this country, and that's using the official number. If we were to use the number as it was calculated in the methodology back in the 80s, we'd be in the mid-teens right now. A big part of that uh, inflation is being driven by energy costs and energy inputs. One of the most uh, surprising things that, that I've noticed about uh, the power of being a net exporter of energy is in the case study of Russia right now. If you look at Russia, as an energy exporter to Europe. Initially, when they invaded Ukraine, their, the ruble lost a tremendous amount of value. Today, the ruble is stronger than before they entered Ukraine because they required international markets to use the ruble for energy. It's a case study that shows that if you have energy security and you're a net exporter, if you're energy dominant as we were, you've got a lot of power in the international community. And we need to make sure we recognize that and invest in that in this nation and this state. America's printing way too much money, and we're not producing to pay off your debt. So you have to produce. Alaska's going to be a part of that. We can produce energy. Uh, we can produce uh, a food chain uh, part. Alaska is limited in what it can do, but America needs to produce some of it. We need to be the breadbasket of the world again. So printing money uh, is not going to help the inflation. Uh, producing uh, in an economy will. And uh, the regulation, the 30 by 30, is going to be a wet blanket on an economy. We just need to produce. That's all there is to it. The argument of increasing supply is the argument that produces dividends over time and in multiple directions. When we work hard to increase our supply, we're not just taking a one-time uh, project or process a tax as a one-time expenditure. An increase in supply provides additional jobs. Additional jobs provide additional income into communities for kids to be involved in community activities, increase community investments, and also increased infrastructure investments. And so while we increase supplies, we don't just take care of the issue that we're facing today, the inflation, but we're actually setting the table for the future to have additional investments and additional resource development, which develops our communities and provides for a robust and healthy economic future for the state. Inflation is a huge problem in America today and in Alaska, and we need to bring fiscal common sense back to Washington, D.C. to get it under control and to address the national debt as well. Unfortunately, that means the Fed is going to have to raise its interest rate and rate in runaway government spending. That's the reality of inflation, and hopefully the recession that it causes will be a small, gentle one and not a big, dramatic one. We have to increase our energy production. That's what we can do locally, and I've said that repeatedly. I'm a strong proponent of that, and I would oppose a tax on the industry because I think that would be uh, 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 counterproductive. Well, there's no question that I would be in favor of increasing supply, but Alaska isn't in favor of increasing supply. Uh, that's not going to take care of inflation, however. It's a long-term solution. 
What we need to do is we need to do away with a highway tax temporarily so that we can get lower costs for, for our fuel. Uh, and we, we need to definitely take a look at the, the Jones Act, which is causing at least $600 million of extra cost here in Alaska as we do attempt to increase supplies. Uh, there's no question putting a tax on the industry is not going to be Increased supply, of course, there's an inherent link I will not support any more quantitative easing, that's printing money out of thin air, uh, no more borrowing money from one foreign country in order to turn around to another foreign country. There are some common sense solutions that too many congressmen aren't adopting, aren't applying, just want to go along to get along. Um, no more raising that phony debt ceiling, because it's not a ceiling. Uh, we just continue and continue every year with our fiscal house not being in order, congressmen, congresswomen uh, increasing that debt ceiling. It's only making everything worse, and Alaska should be playing a pivotal role in getting a handle on inflation, and of course we can. <clears throat> of course I support an increase in domestic energy supply. Um, it would be crazy not to, and I think that not only as Alaskans, but <clears throat> any other energy um, opportunities that are out there, we need to take advantage of those. I do think this is a dire situation though, and we need to really look seriously at taking an all of the above approach because um, I do believe you know, that um, it's not just inflation on energy, it's inflation on the cost of um, vehicles, it's an inf inflation on housing, it's inflation across the board, and inflation really has been the thief in the night. Um, it's been a problem for a number of years, but this compounding inflation, I think, is the most serious problem that we're looking at as Alaskan end-use consumers. So um, I really do think we need to look at all of the solutions and implement them all. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Good morning, my name is Deanna Skabinski. I'm the Executive Director of the Alaska Miners Association. AMA represents all aspects of Alaska's mining industry from large hard rock mines, our state's one coal mine, um, our very uh, plentiful plaster mining industry, and the vendors and contractors that support our industry. And I just want to say I appreciate how many um, times mineral development has been brought up on this panel already. So, Ms. Sweeney, you will be the first one to answer this question. We have a massive shortage of the minerals needed from everything that we do, from computer chips to the products that protect our troops. The mineral supply chain is rapidly becoming a crisis. Both um, this current administration, the Biden administration, and Congress claim to support increasing domestic mineral production, particularly in light of global events going on. But at the same time, regulatory decisions are delaying and even halting uh, mining projects across the nation for products we need, like copper, etc. I'd ask that you think about regulatory when you answer this question, which is, <clears throat> if elected, what will you do to ensure new mines can open in the United States and Alaska? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm opposed to preemptive decisions, and I believe that it sets a very dangerous uh, precedent because it circumvents the trust and the transparency in the public process. Uh, and uh, with this administration, what we're seeing is uh, President Biden is crippling the Alaska economy. Uh, it is, he single-handedly is, is crippling our communities and the industry that we so depend on throughout the entire state. And so we must take this fight back to Congress uh, and, and fact check the administration on the claims that he is making about having access to the resources and yet making it extremely difficult for us to, to, to see projects to uh, develop through the development phase and the, and the production phase. And this is very, very uh, troubling behavior because it puts at risk our trust in the public process and it denies us the opportunity to develop our resources. 
So I think one thing that we've seen specifically within the minerals industry that slows uh, development down, this is true in oil and gas as well, is an abuse of the Clean Water Act. And what we see oftentimes is standards that are applied to mines that require them to have discharge that is even cleaner than the background discharge in the area that they're operating in. And we need to take a close look at the Clean Water Act and how that's being used as an obstructionist a piece of legislation to slow mine development in the United States. I think one thing that we've already talked about a bit is uh, RS 2477s and, and access rights to properties throughout uh, the state of Alaska. And this also applies to, to the roadless rule in Southeast that prevents a lot of the minerals development and minerals potential of Southeast to be realized. Uh, when you travel the state, as I have, and you see the tremendous potential that we have in Southeast Alaska, you recognize that we have underinvested, underdeveloped in that part of the state, and it offers a great deal of economic upside for the people of Alaska. Because the last we had is a unique You have to be able to defend it, and that would be on access issues. Absolutely 
ridiculous, and Mr. Coppola is not an exaggeration, you're right. We're talking mud puddles, you guys, that the feds want to uh, control discharge in and out of. That's going to kill construction in general, not just mines, but construction in general. I'm talking roads, buildings, everything that it is that you need in a civil society that can prosper. Having, having worked in the mineral industry for a prospective mine for six years, I can tell you firsthand that my experience with um, the mining industry is that they take reclamation very seriously. They take environmental impacts very seriously. <clears throat> Excuse me. And not only for their own project, but reclaiming previous projects that um, occurred in times where we didn't have the same environmental standards we do now. Um, the mining industry is also a leader in the gender pay equity issue. Um, they hire as many females as they possibly can. They know that uh, females are a lot better on their heavy equipment, um, so that's a plus. And, and very proactive in workforce development as well. And so I think that the mining and min mineral industry is really a leader in um, showing how to do things well, and I support many mining projects. Thank you. Well, I find it fascinating how the federal government uh, wants to increase clean energy production through wind and solar and all these things that entirely rely 100% on mine minerals, yet they want to choke out uh, mining here in America through all kinds of different ways, whether it be uh, regulation um, or legal battles, lawsuits, in all kinds of other ways, and so again, and they do it in the name of environmentalism and, and social responsibility, and I don't see how it's more socially responsible to have kids mine critical and strategic minerals in the Congo, as opposed to giving our own folks here jobs and doing it right and responsibly here in Alaska. And I tell you what, to those ends, I was really honored again. Three days ago, I had three amendments in our state budget here, and two of those had to do with primacy uh, and one passed. We got RIP funding for RIP for primacy, which I think will help our state. And if I had it my way, uh, I think we need to sue the federal government when time is up. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you to all the candidates for those answers and for staying on time. So we're doing really well on time. So you've had some serious policy questions. How about a fun question just to let people know a little bit more about you? And I think we'll start with Mr. Lowenfels there in the middle since he didn't get to answer our question first. Um, share with us who your first role model was, if you would, please. My dad was my first role model. Uh, my first memory is being in a big wooden green wheelbarrow while he rode him to the, the garden. Uh, he was an inspiration, and uh, he was a small businessman, and uh, he, he really taught me everything I knew. Oh, my dad too. Uh, my dad, a science teacher, um, he came to Alaska after having grown up reading the uh, Jack London novels. He came up to hunt and fish, and just that wild, independent lifestyle he knew that he'd have and he could raise his family. Uh, I thought every kid grew up with dinner table talk being um, memorizing acronyms to figure out how the planets align and the periodic table, uh, speaking of minerals, those things that my dad, he always was talking about, um, things that uh, helped us get through school very successfully and uh, yeah, definitely my dad um, and he's out in Wasilla right now, I'm going to go help him rake his yard when I get home. <laughs> you haven't seen his yard. <laughs> My first role model, I have to admit, was D.B. John Rowe. D.B. John Rowe was our fisheries biologist on the Kuskokwim for 17 years, and that's when I first saw her. I went to a fishing meeting. I grew up commercial fishing with my dad. And it was a hot summer day, and we, all the fishermen were angry for not being able to have a fishing opening. And um, at the head of the table, at the head of the room, in a room full of very upset fishermen, was uh, B. 
beautiful Dee Dee John wrote, and she really commanded the room, made some really great decisions. She's also a champion dog musher, and I also grew up dog mushing, and it's been really great seeing her over the years um, in the Iditarod as a top 10 finisher year after year, um, and now, um, you know, sharing with us through journalism um, her insights on the Iditarod Trail. So definitely Dee Dee John Rowe. Thank you. My first role model was also my father. Uh, he exposed me to music at a young age. He also played guitar. I play guitar and I write songs. And um, that taught me to be passionate about the things I'm doing. Uh, things like anything, anything worth doing is worth overdoing are some of the things we used to talk about. And uh, certainly music has been, uh, it's brought me through combat and a whole lot of other trials in life. And so I thank my dad for that. My first role model was my grandmother, May Abawa Panayu. Uh, she taught me how to, the importance of leading with compassion, uh, but also uh, how to have sharp elbows when necessary. And, and she loved unconditionally, uh, and she uh, also just instilled uh, the, our Indian values into my everyday life, and those are the values that I use to guide me personally and professionally. Well, my first role model was my mom's father, so my grandfather on that side, Lee. Uh, he stopped his life and took care of uh, took care of his grandkids when he didn't have to, and he has uh, always had a strong place in my heart. He's a hard worker, and he taught me the value of hard work. God said a uh, husband and wife would be one, so I have to have mom and dad both in there. Dad taught me how to value serving the community. Mom taught me how to mind my manners. <laughs> you know, uh, dad taught me the value of good hard work and a dollar and how to serve people. Uh, mom taught me how to love people, and uh, I get the best of both worlds. They both are heroes in my mind, and I miss them dearly. They have uh, spent their life and they're gone on to their reward. Uh, I'm hoping I'm on. My first mentor was a combination of my mother and my two sisters. I was raised by a single mother from the age of two years old, and she had the responsibility of bringing us up. And so whenever I had an issue, I always had somebody to turn to, even though she was working two jobs and making sure we were getting through school. If there was some issue that I wasn't doing my part on, she was always there to let me know I had to do it right. And she taught me well to live this life fighting for those who don't have something when you have the ability to help them. So she instilled in me a great value of justice and my sisters, on the other hand, we kind of raised each other, and they were the ones who helped me to understand that we have to work together collaboratively in this world. You don't always get what you want, but when you work together, you definitely can get what you need. Well, I love my mom and dad. They're tremendous people, but I would have to say the biggest role model in my life is Jay Hammond, Governor Hammond, the father of the Permanent Fund and the dividend, who's a close friend of mine, very much like an uncle growing up in Juneau when I was a teenager. I used to go on hunting and fishing trips with my dad and Jay, just the three of us on the family boat uh, for several days. And dad, dad and Jay would talk about the future of Alaska and what to do with all this uh, enormous oil wealth. So Jay made a huge impression on me. I used to go over to the governor's mansion and play pool with dad and Jay on what later became the Clementillion's pool table and is now down in uh, Kachemak Bay. Uh, Jay taught me about the importance of resource development conservation, subsistence, and love for Alaska people. Okay, thank you all very much. So we're gonna to end today with just, um, we've got eight lightning round questions here. So each of the candidates has, we have yes, no paddles in front of you. And so when I, after I ask the question, just hold up your answer. So the first one is, do you support the PRO Act? Okay, the second question. Do you support the repeal of the roadless rule in the Tongass? Okay, question.
question number three. Do you support the Biden administration's 30 by 30 initiative, also known as America the Beautiful? Number four, in 2020, did you support ballot measure one to raise oil taxes? All right, in 2018, did you support another ballot measure one, the Salmon Habitat Initiative? Number six, do you support primacy efforts for states over federal permitting laws? Okay, number seven is, do you support the Ambler Access Project? And the final is, would you have voted for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? All right, thank you very much. How about a round of applause for our candidates? So just a, a few closing comments. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to the candidates for participating today. And if I could ask you to stay seated when we adjourn, we'd like to have the CEOs come over and get a picture with you seated there in us.